In this season, we strive to bring you stories that decenter history. History resonates differently with different people. Through sharing these personal stories, both from our guests and the people they talk about. We want to challenge the dominant narratives that focus on single strands and one-dimensional stories. Join us for season two of Who This Podcast. Season two is here to redefine the way we understand our past. Because the past really happened and history is just what somebody wrote down. Have you ever seen a decapitated head and thought, damn, she's fine. My name is Ludmila Andrade, and today I'm going to be talking about Maria de Deia, more famously known as Maria Bonita. So, today we're going to be talking about Maria Alia da Silva or Maria Gomes de Oliveira. Both names are attributed to someone who, in her lifetime, was known as Maria de Deia, a daughter of small farmers who uh, was born in a ranch in Bahia, in the northeast of Brazil. Her birth date is also contested, being either on 1910 or in 1911. But unlike the, the mystery over her birth date or her real name, her death is very well documented, being in 1938, when she was just 27 years old. Uh, like many women uh, from her surroundings, Maria Judea got married very young, at 15. She married a shoemaker and she had a very unhappy marriage. Her husband was a womanizer who often cheated on her. Because of that, she would run away and escape to her parents' house. And she really talked about leaving her husband, something that was very uncommon at that time, when women were expected to just accept the husband's infidelity. So her life changed when she met and started an affair with Lampião, the most famous cangaceiro in Brazilian history, a social bandit that terrorized the northeast of Brazil. Well, it's interesting that you introduced them as uh, terrorizing the Northeast because a lot of the folk stories and what I've been reading is that they're also seen as heroes and heroines of the poor. Yes. But there was the rape and the killing and the kidnapping. Of course. <laughs> of course. It's interesting how it's been, yeah. you know, uh, integrated into cultural history yeah. and what was going on at the time. And I, and I think there is this element of of admiration mm. that the common people had for cangaceros. But there was also fear because mm. if they come to your city and as much as they are, you know, maybe throwing parties or in any way benefiting the people, if one of them say, hey, we're staying at your house tonight, you're not really in a position to say no. And if the police comes, you're going down with them. Mm. So... It wasn't just an admiration and it's not that they were necessarily kind to the people. There was also a big element of using the people in the cities where they would pass through. Mm. So interesting. She was like 19 when she met uh, met him, right? Yes, yeah, something like that. So, no. Yeah, no, yeah, something like that because she lived with him for eight years. So. But what, what was the, like you're a nine, I'm just trying to picture, you know, mm -hmm. I, you're a 19 year old woman living with her parents at the mm -hmm. at the time uh this guy passes by uh, i read that he wore like really really fancy shiny clothes yes and then she decided to follow him like i do you know anything about the reasoning of that like why why would why would she do that like why would she just sort of go with a random random guy yeah i i don't i think it was a real love story i think they did fell in love uh with each other I think that the real question is why did the band accept her? That's really interesting. Yeah, I right, think because wait, can we know a bit more about how they operated to kind of understand? Yes. So cangaceros, uh, they were groups of bandits. They could be composed of a couple of dozens up to a hundred men. They were nomads, so they would just travel their whole lives in the northeast. That's a very large. Uh, piece of land, so we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, and they would go through the cities, well, can barely say cities, probably villages, or from ranch to ranch. This is a very uh, rural area. 
in the northeast, most of the people live across the coast. So inland, you have mostly ranches. And it's a very impoverished, but very dry, really harsh environment to live in. And because of the, the ranches, you have a lot of land conflict. So small farmers often losing their, their land to ranch owners. So uh, they, uh, the cagaceros appeared in a bit the turn of the century and really became prevalent phenomenon in the Northeast in the 20s and 30s of the 20th century. So they would just travel from city to city. Often uh, they would attack the more privileged class. There was a lot of violence in these attacks. We were talking about murder, rape, also kidnapping for ransom. But they are also known for being uh, kinder with the lower classes. They would throw parties and finance parties in the, in the cities where they stayed. They called bailis. They would consume in the local market, uh, things like that. So there was some level of sympathy and admiration from uh, local people. But there's also some fear in it because they, they brought trouble to the town. Police was always chasing them. So it, it was uh, always very volatile and always with the risk of things yeah. getting, getting tricky very fast. I'm interested in that part, like how... How do people get into into such a movement? Like, what's triggering? Do you know, like, more the contextual situation that people were in and that made them also become very violent and, yeah, I mean, start murdering uh, rich people? Yeah, I think it was uh, a lot coming from that social context. Like I said, a lot of uh, class inequality. But violence was prevalent in in different uh, areas not just bandits or people involved in crime but the police at the time which wasn't a very well established institutional police it was very much uh, people paid by uh, rich people they would also be extremely violent towards the lower classes so there was already this this environment full of violence that people grew up in a lot of interfamily uh, conflicts so Uh, that are also very many Brazilian movies that portray that. So if there is a conflict between two families, I would kill someone from your family. We would uh, respect your grieving period. But the moment that the grieving period is finished, I can expect your family to come back for a member of mine. And it's usually the older brother kills their older brother and then it goes down to the younger siblings. Um, there is even a movie that shows the mother of the family, she hangs in a wash uh, line the, the blood-stained clothes of uh, her son. And when the blood turns yellow, she says to the youngest, okay, now it's your turn to go and get one of them because our, our grieving period has passed. So a lot of this violence just served as, as motivation. And it was also a bit of an adventurous life. You're on the back of a horse, traveling around. They had no life expectancy, nothing, uh, nothing for them, uh, for them to, to live up to. So I yeah. think it was a bit easy. And, and these were like roaming groups of men yes. for the most part, you know, like self-sufficient, like nomadic lifestyle. They go from, you exactly. know, crossing like the grasslands from ranch to ranch. There was no women involved. Like, exactly. Possibly like, hey, these girls are going to slow us down. Mm -hmm. But then somehow she managed to join. Yeah. So uh, that's what made her quite a pioneer when she met Lampion and decided to join him. I could imagine that she was, uh, was accepted into the group because Lampion was such uh, a leader of the group. So the others probably had to accept. But there was a belief that women were bad luck, that um, there was also something a bit religious that men believed that they had their body closed to protect it. But in their relationship with women, they made themselves vulnerable. So carrying them with, uh, with the band uh, was a risk that they weren't willing to take until Maria Bonita joined. And um, Maria Gidea, as she was known in her lifetime, she was described as having uh, a very loud laugh. She liked dancing, so she loved going to bailes. Even before she joined Lampion, when she had fights with her husband, she wouldn't just go home and cry. She would go to bailes and just dance all night. And she was a bit of like a prankster, so always, uh, always laughing and making fun of people. 
So she, she said to have been very likable. And after she joined over, uh, over the years, other women and other girls also joined the band. Some of them voluntarily, but not all. Some of them were kidnapped and forced into marriage with uh, the men of the group. Some of them being as young as 11 and 12. Oof. So it was, yeah, it, it was quite, quite brutal. And the lifestyle was also very brutal because sometimes they often had to run from the police and sometimes they would go days without water and food because it's a very arid uh, environment. So what I read is that indeed uh, Lampio, mm -hmm. uh, that he was quite the aggressor. Mm -hmm. He he was very excessive in his in his violence, uh, mm -hmm. what you what you described. And I know there's a recorded saying of him, which I think speaks speaks for itself in many ways. So if the saying goes, or like the the quote goes, if you have to kill, kill quickly. But for me, killing a thousand is just like killing one. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's very dark and mm -hmm. and I think well we went into the drive of him, mm -hmm. but I'm cur I'm still very curious about about Maria. Like she was clearly in love with this man, mm -hmm. but there's still a lot of violence going on. Yeah, did she accept this? Do we know this? I think so because I, it, and this is an assumption because she never left him. I mean, there's also. The, the question, could she leave him? <laughs> Probably not. But she became his life partner as short as uh, their lives was. There was there were there were cases that she tried to, you know, uh, put some limits into the violence and, and say, okay, that's enough. But the violence was towards, like I said, it was a time that violence permeated so much the relationships that They were outside, so from the group towards uh, their victims, but it was also inside with, for instance, these girls that were kidnapped and just forced to marry the, the men. So I think it was, give, uh, violence was seen as a bit as a given, you know? Uh, so there wasn't this awareness of, no, this is bad and we have to do things differently. It's interesting that you brought up that quote because I also made a note of it. And what I took from that is, first of all, that Lampiao sees banditry as a necessity. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, how I view the people that join this cangacero, that they felt like this is necessary response to the situation that we've been born into, which from what Luigi has shared with us seems quite, yeah, lacking any kind of opportunity, the weather. And and then when he goes on to say, because he was also quite a religious man who seemed to be quite conflicted in terms of, you know, mercy and his relation to human beings. Uh, but if you kill one person in a lot of religions, that's like, if you save one person, you're saving humanity. And maybe he saw it as if I've already killed one or if I've already killed a thousand, like the sunk cost fallacy I've invested. So I'm going to go all the way to my death. That's I don't know. very dark though. Yeah. It is dark, but yeah. that it seems like the life that they were leading prior was dark. He, his whole family was murdered. Both his parents. Yeah. What I find interesting is that he was also reportedly or potentially from a richer family. Mm. At least they were landowners and etc. So it's always, I find with your sunk cost sort of take mm. on it, like I do wonder, is this a situation where you you have chosen this lifestyle and then now you, well, you're, you're bound to it. This is your life mm. and you're going to carry it on through. And I, I can imagine that after a certain moment kind of, leaving it behind it would feel like defeat it would feel like yeah. you know you've given up something that you've made part of yourself and i do imagine because i've been i found it interesting this whole time as to why she chose to join the gang and i yeah i think i am empathetic with the idea of this is a new life i'm choosing it like mm. this is liberating to a certain extent um and i guess within that the dynamic of adding vulnerability to the group because a they found it as bad luck because women would make them more vulnerable ironically she probably did make them more vulnerable but maybe not in a bad way because you do need vulnerability to be a better person in general i'm not saying she made them good people but it's it's just an interesting dynamic mm. and i also i i was wondering like within the context of 
Brazil in general? Because I know there's stories like Bonnie and Clyde, you know, there's like the whole romanticized power couple that does crime together. Like, did she, did she have this persona? Like, is she looked back as some, as like... Yeah, so... It's interesting because what you just said about Lampion, I agree completely. I think it's a lifestyle that you can back off and people die so early, so they have no time to back off. And I think he became a legend. He was the leader of uh, his gang. They got a lot of money from their activities. He was feared. He was respected. He was admired. At the time, I think as a man, this is as good as it gets. It was a hard lifestyle, but, you know, he wasn't going to get uh, much better if he wasn't into Cangasso. And for her, so the most people knew about uh, their activities through local newspapers. And local newspapers got their sources from the police. And what the police would say mm. is that these women were also hardened criminals, that they also took part in the killings, in the kidnappings, mm. etc. And they would put them as very masculine and, you know, bloodthirst. But uh, what the historians have discovered is that it's not the case that, first of all, they kept a lot of the gender roles that they had back home that they took care of the men, cooking, cleaning, as much as they could. They didn't have a house, but as much as they could, they were given this more domestic role. And, uh, and they were also extremely uh, oppressed by them. So the one rule that they had was being faithful to their husband. Any infidelity or suspicion of such was, uh, was punished by murder. And uh, the men didn't even have to leave the group. It was business as usual. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just really complex. I think it, it is a scenario of all the options suck. Mm. <laughs> so I guess if you want a bit of adventure, if you wanted to get out of mm. that wrench that you were born and you probably never seen anything different, mm. I guess this is an, an interesting uh, proposal. And like I said, I think for both men and women, once you start doing it, you can look back. Because even if you were to give up, you would still, if you go back to your city, you're still going to be arrested. You're still going to be. And we know by the end of their story, it's not exactly like you go to jail and then you rebuild your life. It's, it's interesting because a lot of those stories that we covered already are also about this, right? A lot of those stories are often often around, yeah, it, people are in, a, are in bad spots and what's, what's, the, what's a better escape uh, even if the escape is also a path of horror and violence, it's interesting. But for me, there's a running thread of the devil you choose is better than the devil you're dealt with. fucked with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so like yeah, and once you and adding on to that, like what I find interesting is that once you enter the fringes of society, it's so it's a one way street. You know, like you can't. I mean, unless there's like a whole reconciliation, like social movement around the issue, it's not going to, you're not going to yeah. go back and min mingle at, you know, also, your community center. Yeah, yeah, also because the women's role in history is so ingrained in us as we literally sit here and talk. But it's also, if a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, the same structure of your young teenager who's thrust into this lifeless, loveless marriage. I also read that she lost all three of her sons in infancy. And when At she meets teenagehood, still. yeah, in yeah. teenagehood, and then she meets, she becomes an acquaintance with Lampiao, who's this legend in, you know, the region where she's born, where things are just a bit ruthless. Um, so I guess I'd rather choose my devil if all your options are devils. Maybe a leeway then to how did the story end? Yeah, so uh, the story ends very tragic, tragically, because um, in 38, after eight years of living with uh, Lampion's band, they were betrayed by a local uh, businessman. Well, he had, I think, a little store. <laughs> I think businessman <laughs> is quite a generous description. Some say that he, that he betrayed the group. Others say that he was tortured by the police and he ended up uh, giving away their location where they were sheltered. And the band was attacked by the police and they were all, well, some of them were murdered, 11 of them. 40 of them managed to escape. But both Maria Bonita and Lampion were among the, uh, the murdered ones. 
after that, their heads were decapitated and sent to the State Forensic Institute in Bahia. And then after it was put out for a public exhibition until 69, and only then their families managed to retrieve uh, their remains and bury them. So for wow. 30 years, they were in, in exhibition, their heads. Why? Wait, wait, do you know what the exhibition was on? Like these are... Yeah, the, the, the cangaceros, yeah. This is them, the big ones, look yeah. at their heads. Exactly. Okay, that's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. pretty graphic. <laughs> exactly. And the interesting thing is that her nickname was attributed post-mortem. So one of the people that uh, had access to her de decapitated head thought that she was very beautiful and gave her the nickname of Maria Bonita, which means Beautiful Mary. And that's how she entered history. But while alive, she wasn't known like that at all, even though she was known for being a, a beautiful and vain woman. So I think it's a little bit sad that the name that she is famous for were, was given, you know, without her consent, probably by the people that were mm. involved in, in handling her remains. I thought it was a very sad and I think that she deserves to be yeah. known by the name that she was called when she was alive. That is Maria Gideia. But yeah, it was it was very tragic. But as we said, that's how most most of them ended their lives very young in a very brutal manner. And I think that that's what they signed up for. I think uh, it was a bit expected. Mm. And she lives on in popular culture. There's so many movies. I mean, yeah. How did you grow up hearing about their story? Um, so everybody knows about uh, Lampião and Maria Bonita. And they know her as being his partner, mm. and that's mostly it. Because, like I said, all of these inconsistencies or lack of certainty on information is because it's a very poor area, people live very distant, so there's a lack of documentation. But what is very strong in the North is the folkloric aspect that stories take. So it's... Positive and negative, it's positive because the stories live on, but they do take a life of their, their own. So true. it's difficult to know how much is true and how much is uh, just the stories that people tell and retell. But there's also a lot of what we call uh, literatura de cordel, which is when people, the people who could write, would write their, their versions and then they would sell it in the markets and they would just put it in kind of like a clothesline and you can just pick it up and, and buy and take it home. So that's how she became, uh, both her and Lampion became these, these folkloric uh, figures. A lot of oral history, a lot of uh, music as well. And then more recently, some serious historical work done to recapture that. It's interesting because one biographer went to the house where she, she grew up and one of the descendants were there, not a, a, uh, her, her kid, but I think a kid of one of her siblings. And he himself said that he didn't know if she was real because it, it, it was a bit of a mythical creature uh, and he didn't know how much she had really existed. And just after seeing pictures that he, he really believed that she, will, she really existed. Mm. I just wanted to say that it's, it's very interesting how it became a folkloric, mythical story. And I can very much imagine that from multiple angles, people wanted to tell the story. Like from the, let's say, the popular people's angle of we had someone who was sort of our champion. I mean, ignoring the fact that they were also terrorized, but, you know, champion for the poor, sticking it to the system, living nomadically, you know, in a Wild West format. It's like very... Mm attractive to talk about and then also from the vindictive security government perspective you also want to paint the story you want to tell the story as these are boogeymen mm -hmm. and they're coming for you and we had to put a stop to it i mean that's why there's like exhibitions of their heads like it was probably set as an example to not do this or as an example of look at this lawless period we you know we had mm -hmm. to put an end to it so it's very it's like one of the situations that i can easily understand why it became larger than life and people spoke about it for yeah. sure and it was as late as 1968 i think that, that the her, family got mm -hmm. the remains yeah, to yeah, bury yeah. them and she died at 27 right that's yes. also it it adds to the 
Rock and roll. <laughs> rock and roll. Like he was he like was a rock same. star of of the er- era and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. But what are your, what are your takeaways on on this story? I think that my takeaway is that we need to try as much as possible to understand things on their own term and in their own context. I think the figure of Maria Bonita is now they're trying to bring it back as this feminist icon, and I think we need to be a little bit careful about that. It's not saying that she wasn't a pioneer or she wasn't a strong woman, but the way that we understand feminism now didn't even exist back in her day. So let's not attribute those values with the eyes that we have now. I think we can very much tell these stories that deserve to be told and uh, learn from these characters, but respecting the context where they came from and letting their stories talk through the lens of their time and not through the lens of our time. Mic drop! <laughs> Love that. That's beautiful. That was a great answer. Thanks a lot for being on. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope this story stole your heart. You can catch us wherever you listen to your podcasts and see you next time. <laughs>